Okay, I, I see all your names here. So I guess there's no newcomer. Um, everybody who was there in the previous class is also here. Okay, right. So, um, so just wanted to ask you this question. Um, since we're doing this course, biblical preaching. Um, you know, what do you think about this whole uh, concept of preaching? Right. Is it for everybody? Is it for somebody? Um, what do you think? Anyone? Let me say preaching. Okay. What do you think? Is it for everybody? Is it for some people? Yeah, um, Lubega. Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, good afternoon. I don't know what time it is there, but here it is very early in the morning. It is 7.33. Okay, it's 11 a.m. here. Okay, good morning and uh, morning. good uh, whatever, everybody. Uh, to me, I think that the preaching is for everybody. Because uh, when Jesus Christ was living here, he said that we should go to preach. He did not tell one person or two. He told all of us. So all believers are supposed to preach, either at home, either at where he works, either where... So I think it is in a nutshell for, for everybody. We should all learn how to preach. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else? Um, do you think... Um, uh, you know, do you also agree with what Lubega shared? Or um, do you see it any other way? Um, yes, Pastor. Yes, Isaac. Yeah, I think I'll go with uh, Brother Lobiga. Mm -hmm. yeah, pre preaching is, should be or is for everybody. It's like the parable of the sower. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we, we need to spread the word. So right. uh, I think it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes what happens, I just see Jeffina's, uh, and we need to preach, um, us to spread the gospel all over the world, not just um, some part. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's so true. So the thing is, uh, I think all of us uh, understand and all of us agree that um, we are all called or commissioned to preach the gospel, right? Now, the setting in which we do, the environment in which we do, the realm uh, in which we actually do this, uh, preaching could be different, right? Uh, but the fact is, the truth is that all of us have been commissioned. So I'm just going to read from Matthew 28, right? Um, Matthew 28 and verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So making disciples, and an important aspect of that is to communicate, to proclaim, right? So preaching is proclaiming something, professing something, okay? Uh, let's look at Mark also, um, the last chapter. It says, go into Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved he who does not believe will be condemned and these signs will follow those who believe in my name they will cast out demons they will speak with new tongues um, they will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means hurt them they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover okay so it says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature so you see that um, well for whom was this commission it was for his followers for his disciples so it is for all of us as uh, disciples of the lord jesus okay so many times we disqualify ourselves because we look at preaching as pulpit ministry well a large part of it is right we see okay it's if in a church in a podium or a pulpit or on a stage uh, you know uh, i feel that okay i'm not called for that kind of a thing therefore you know uh, i'm not called to preach right but this preaching or proclaiming uh, the message 
or proclaiming uh, the message of the word of God and particularly the gospel it could be in any any setting. You know, it could be a small small group setting, home group kind of a setting. It could be a very informal one to one kind of a setting, right? So in all these, if you when you consider all that, we see that all of us are called to be preaching the gospel. All of us are called to be preaching the truth of God's word. Okay. So you don't have to disqualify yourself saying, you know, I, well, uh, I'm not articulate or, you know, I, I can't go before a crowd of people and do it. You don't have to disqualify. Maybe another word which will be helpful is if you look at the word, okay, communicate. Okay. Proclaim. Profess. Declare these words, and especially the word communicate, right? Can you communicate? Can you profess? Can you declare? Can you proclaim? Yes, sure. All of us can, and all of us do, right? Um, so the, while the setting might be different, right? We might not be uh, in a typically in a fivefold ministry kind of a setup, but all of us as disciples, as followers of the Lord Jesus, we can communicate. The, the truth of God's word, we can communicate the gospel, we can proclaim, profess, declare it. So all of us are. Okay. So this course is about biblical preaching, which means when we are when we are called to profess and proclaim and communicate, okay, what are some things that we can look at? You know, is there a science to it? Uh, are people born as preachers? Right. So we're going to look at that. So it's a it's an interesting, again, a very practical course where we look at some of the theoretical aspects of it. Okay, uh, what what does it involve when it comes to preparing a message, putting together uh, a message that we can preach or communicate? It, and primarily, we are looking at a formal setting, right? Uh, but it can it, it need not be so. So, putting together, studying the Word of God, putting together a message, communicating it. Right? So, we're going to look at some pra practical aspects of that uh, also. Okay. So um, the first thing that we need to understand is that um, you know what we believe in and what we are convicted of, or how we believe what we believe, is very important. Okay, um, because that is what you are going to communicate. So it's important that we believe rightly, or we we believe. Uh, we are not deceived by it. You know, we believe and uh, we believe the right things because what we believe in, uh, what we are convicted of, or what we are sure of, is going to affect our life. You know, you look at it, you know, what you believe so strongly, you know, in changes your life, right? Because we begin to live our life according to it. Okay? And, um, and, and of course, when it's the truth of God's word, uh, the God's word has intrinsic power because Hebrews, uh, uh, you know, talks about that. Hebrews four, we see that it has, it is living, it is alive, it is powerful, life changing, creative, right? And all that you can add. Um, so therefore, you know, when we believe rightly about the word of God, it has intrinsic power to change us, right? We believe, we mix faith with it. Right, Hebrews again talks about that. You know, if we if we do not mix faith with the words that we hear, then it doesn't profit. But then, if we mix faith with it, we receive it, changes us, it changes the way we look at things, changes our perspective. Whole whole lot of things happen when we believe rightly. So, what we believe in is very very important if for us as personally, and also for us as communicators of this truth. So what we believe in. Um, therefore, it's important that we that we divide the word rightly. Right? Paul, in his instruction to Timothy, says, you know, rightly dividing the word of God. Right? You give you give yourself entirely to this, um, this to these teaching, but he also says, you know, you rightly divide the word of God. Right? Uh, it's very important. Okay. So we, we when we look at um, uh, you know the even before we get into this whole aspect of preaching. Uh, or biblical preaching, or, or what is uh, it's known as homiletics, uh, we need to, uh, you know, maybe look at the interpretation of it as well. Okay, because we go, what is the content? 
the content is the word of god so if i rightly divide the word of god if i rightly interpret the word of god uh, in the line of uh, several things then my life you know will be changed i will be convicted i will be standing on this conviction of uh, you know this truth and what i communicate right with my words with my life uh, with my choices with my lifestyle everything you know will be life producing okay, that's very important otherwise what i communicate will not be producing life um, but i'll be deceiving myself right um so so it's very important that we look at um how we interpret scripture okay. so we're going to look at uh, a review something that we would have studied last semester or maybe last year okay which is uh, hermeneutics right you looked at how to biblically interpret scripture there's something that you looked last uh, last year studied last year yeah hermeneutics biblical hermeneutics so so we're going to just we'll do a quick recap of that review of that and before we get into uh, you know uh, homiletics okay so so okay uh, let me just share the uh, thing that i have okay Okay, so here we have, um, I hope it's big enough. Okay, so biblical, uh, you know, it's called hermeneutics, right? Rightly interpreting the word, rightly interpreting scripture. So, uh, so what is the goal of it? What is the objective? The end result of it is that I need to discover the meaning, know the meaning of the text as it is intended by the original author. Okay, now the Holy Spirit, God, uh, the Father, the Father wrote through this. Uh, uh, people wrote as they were inspired, right? As we moved by the Spirit of God. So God really is the author, but He uses human vessels, and it was in a particular time frame, time period, and in a in a typical culture, right? Uh, when we say culture, it, we're talking about beliefs, we're talking about values, we're going to we're talking about customs, we're talking about traditions, and all that was there. and this message was presented in such a environment okay so it meant something okay so um so it meant something to that that audience okay now while we look at you know uh, our we're going to look at that you know when we look at uh, our culture our time period well it it is very different vastly different from how it was then Okay, so we need to consider that as well. Okay, so what are some factors, or what are some things to consider in order to interpret it? Okay, because inter when we interpret it rightly, we will believe rightly. When we believe rightly, we will apply it rightly, and it will result in uh, right living, right or right. Um, it'll be life producing. Okay, so that is um, so that that's the uh, that's the basis, right? Why we want to interpret. Uh, scripture rightly okay so um so when we look at uh, the language itself okay so first first of all we need to interpret it um, grammatically okay when we look at the language um meaning of certain words phrases sentences okay so when we when we consider the grammar of the text we see that uh, well it it does not really change so much over the years it does not change but it's important for us to consider those words okay so there are different tools which help us there are you know um uh, where we can go to the root of the word whether it's the hebrew or whether it's the greek um in the old testament and the new so we we can look at that and then we can consider that um and to rightly get you know what does it actually um mean okay this word uh this phrase what does it mean so interpreting it grammatically is very important okay so um otherwise it it can become very very vague okay for you know i i remember one of the uh, I, i forget if it was in college or school but then uh, i remember the english class and and the and the, prof, and the teacher was saying that uh, you know the word cute we use the word cute 
but if you look at the and, and cute means you know we use it for a you know maybe a puppy or a cat or you know maybe a person also you know so cute maybe for a little baby child you know uh, say so cute uh, but actually the actual origin of the word if you look at it apparently you can look it up i, I vaguely remember this being said that it actually meant ugly okay uh, something that is something that is ugly but over the years it has actually come to mean something that is you know something that is adorable something that is cute okay you can check that out um so so the thing is this right we need to know the meaning of the word and how it was used in that particular you know context how it was used in that uh, culture okay so grammatically interpreting it okay so when we look, when we interpret the text in a, uh, you know grammatically okay we see that we can just take the language okay the original language whether we study the hebrew uh, of course uh, you know in our courses we're not actually looking into hebrew but whether you're studying the hebrew and the greek or whether you're looking at a translation okay so does it make sense like the way the words words are the way the sentence is the way the phrase is you know, does it make sense okay um like for example john chapter 3 and verse 36 you know i'm just projecting that um so he who he who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him okay, it's it's very plain very clear we don't have to you know assign any other meaning to it right it's a very plain language very clear okay he who has a son he who believes in the son has everlasting life which means the opposite of it is also mentioned there he who does not believe shall not see life okay uh but instead of life there's the wrath of god very clear okay if you look at acts chapter 1 and verse 11 again you know this is the conversation that the angels have um these heavenly beings have with the disciples okay soon after the lord is taken up into heaven it says um It says men of galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven this same jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven it's talking about the second coming of the lord right uh, a lot of us don't have any issues about the first coming of the lord but we you know sometimes think okay will he will he come it's been so many years so many centuries you know is he going to come again well the scripture is very plain and very clear it says you know the heavenly beings are saying that in the same manner in which you saw him being taken into heaven he will come okay so it's very 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 literal very plain you know no two words no two ways about it okay so when we look at a text we interpret it grammatically we look at it does it make sense okay then the other thing is that like in every language there is a figure of speech you know it could be a simile it could be a metaphor right um so there could be a figure of speech you know like for example when you say you know uh, well this person was a lion in battle okay, what does it mean it means that this particular person this warrior was was you know was uh, very fierce in battle very majestic and fierce uh and uh, you know totally intimidating so 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 and so was you know was, was a lion in battle so when you if you look at it in a literal sense okay was a lion in battle you might if you if you interpret it only literally it means that okay he became a lion he changed into a lion right that's the literal sense literal meaning of it but we know you know it's just a figure of speech like knowing a language studying a language you realize that okay it's a figure of speech it just means that the person was a fierce a person was fierce like a fear like a lion okay so um so so that is what it means so we we should give some you know weightage for figure of speech as well as we are studying scripture right a couple of examples here okay mark chapter 1 and verse 5 then all the land of judea and those from jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the river jordan the jordan river confessing their sins okay so what does that mean you know like in figures of speech we have metaphor we have simile you know like this person was a lion in battle or was like a lion in battle 
also there could be a hyperbole okay which means that um, the lord jesus said you know why do you look at the speck in another person's eye but uh, not at the log which is in your eye a, 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 it's a hyperbole is also part of a it, it's like a figure of speech like it's in language which means that does that mean that this person has a huge log sticking into their eye no the lord is saying something hey you're overlooking your own you know uh, defects or your own uh, you know shortcomings which are actually very apparent you're overlooking that but you're looking at the speck you know looking at that small thing which is in that other person and you're pointing that out and you know uh, and and you're doing that okay so that also you know something like that mark chapter 5 then all the land of judea and those from jerusalem went out does that mean that every household every person who was inhabiting went out to be baptized it talks about the majority it talks about great crowds it talks about the multitude which went there okay um the lord jesus also saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me okay so what is literally his body no it was a symbolic act he gave the bread he broke the bread gave it and said okay this is my body okay so which is a symbolic act okay so uh, some of those things that we need to consider okay and and uh, while we are interpreting grammatically it also may, uh, you know some of these passages have symbols the uh, you know symbolic um things which are there and we also need to uh, consider that as well and and many times the symbols are themselves explained okay the text itself gives interpretation for these symbols so you understand okay this is what it is this is what it means you know a typical example is revelation 1 um and verse 9 probably we'll we'll, ta- we'll take a look at that um actually you'll study more about symbols in the prophetic uh, class um Okay, so let's look at Revelation nine verse. Sorry, Revelation one and verse nine. So it says, um, you know, it says John. Um, it, it talks about the, this um, experience that John has, uh, this vision, and he's. Um, it says, "I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, verse ten, and I heard a you know loud voice and all that." And uh, he goes on to explain how, what he saw, the Son of Man, and um, you know, it, it says here that. he had in his right hand seven stars okay verse 16 and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining okay and uh, it also says uh, that uh, verse 13 sorry and in the midst of the seven lampstands uh, one stood like the son of man so we see seven golden lampstands verse 12 says seven golden lampstands and in the midst uh, the son of man referring to Jesus his description and in his right hand he had seven stars uh, and so on so when we read through and when we go to verse uh, verse 20 uh, it explains those symbols these items which are you know which john noticed in the vision the text itself gives an explanation the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven you know golden lamp stands the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lamp stands which you saw are the seven churches <coughs> excuse me right so you see the text actually has given a lot of symbols and it also gives the meaning of those symbols okay this is what it is the seven stars are not just stars but actually it refers to the messengers or the angels which are carrying a message the seven golden lampstands well they they are lampstands but this is what it refers to it refers to the church right uh, which are supposed to illuminate uh, and uh, throw light uh, into the darkness uh, illuminate the darkness right so with the truth so we see that okay so many of the times the text will either from the from that place itself or from some other place will give meaning okay okay second thing uh okay let me just see if anyone has any questions yeah no okay the second thing is that we also need to understand and interpret it from the place of scripture okay so uh it helps to study um the background okay the culture the customs and all that and which is what you you know normally go through you know when you do the survey 
the Old Testament survey, the New Testament survey. You know, you look at the time period, you look at the author, who are the audience, and and so on, right? And a little bit of uh, the history, right? What was happening there? You look at that. Okay. So, um, so, so the question we need to ask is, okay, what is what does it mean? You know, this particular some some of these passages are difficult, and we see that how uh, how does it help us to interpret? You know, how does it, how do you interpret it? What does it mean to this original audience? You know, this particular uh, thought that is expressed here, what does it mean to the original audience? Okay, so when we study that, we we understand. Okay, for some examples, you know, Genesis 15, 7, about cutting the covenant. Okay, so now, in our day and time, okay, when, you, when, you, when you talk about covenant and... Um, uh, we, we typically we, we might look at okay we looked at marriage right we looked at okay something that is signed something that is spoken um, a contract so you know uh, an agreement or maybe a handshake uh, you know if it's a verbal thing um, but this whole thing of cutting a covenant if you use it to, with someone who's you know someone who's never studied that this covenant and all is not a usual language. So it, it, it could leave someone, you know, very perplexed. Okay, what does it mean? And what does this cutting mean? Right? But when we when we when we read the you know the, the culture and the custom of those times that it involved, you know, taking those two animals or birds and then cutting it and and the persons making the covenant going through them, then you understand, okay. You know, it involved shedding of blood and it involved this and the people walking through it and uh, uh, walking in the middle of it. And that is how it, a covenant was cut, literally. All right. So we understand, OK, this is what it means. Okay. So uh, another place, uh, again, is, um, you know, Revelation 2 it talks about, uh, you know, where, where Satan's throne is. Right. So. So Pergamum, and um, so was Satan really seated there? Well, there was a there was a worship of uh, these powers of darkness and this deity, uh, which was happening there. And uh, this place was referred to as um, you know a, as a place where uh, Satan's uh, throne is. So uh, is it Pergamum? Yeah, I just let's just look at chapter two, verse thirteen. Yeah, Satan's throne. Right, it's referred to. So, um, so you understand that okay, there was worship happening there, and uh, you know all kinds of wickedness, and places referred to as a Satan's throne. Okay. Um, then in one Corinthians eleven, also you know it talks about how uh, you know short hair or uh, shaving of a person's uh, you know head, uh, or not person, a uh, woman's head. Uh, was considered shameful, you know. That does that mean, you know, we should not cut, uh, uh, you know, we should not have a haircut. Women should not cut their hair. Um, what does it mean, you know? So in that culture, definitely, you know, definitely it was, it was something uh, of, uh, uh, it, it was not a nice thing because typically the the priestess uh, or the temple uh, prostitutes they would have that kind of a hairstyle, you know? so. That is what they would relate themselves to, and also, you know, the heads that were shaven, where, you know, uh, if they, if someone was in um, uh, adultery and lived in adultery and they were convicted of it, so they were, uh, you know, it was done for them. So, so Paul has to, you know, write to such a people, and uh, he's he's writing about that. So he's mentioning that he's referring to that. So um, all that. Right, so we look at history, and that also gives us uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, you know understanding. Okay, this is how it was. So therefore, I can't take it literally, right? Uh, and I don't have to apply it literally. So when we when we you know we when we end up doing uh, it literally, we end up hurting a lot of people as well, right? It is not re relevant for you know a culture, and then. We we end up hurting a lot of people. So um, one thing that we need to understand is um, the difference between truth and culture. Okay, there is eternal truth in God's word, and there is the the tradition, custom, culture of man. 
Now, in some places, this is very intrinsically like intertwined, right? Still, you can't really, you know, differentiate. Oh, wow. What is it? But if you look at it closely, you know, it is, is it the truth? Does it have anything to do with the eternal truth of God's word? Or is it something that is a tradition or a custom? And some of these things are harmless, right? It could be something that is cultural, something that is harmless, and, and it's fine, absolutely okay. So we don't have to take something that is cultural and hammer it as the truth. Okay. Oh, to, to take it out and then you you say you profess it, you declare it to be the truth. If you're not, you know, adhering to it, then you know, then you're a sinner. Uh, yeah, the scripture, you know, in, in Corinthians, Paul writes, and greet one another with a holy kiss. It was a culture for the for the people at that time, you know, for uh, of the of the men of those days to to greet one another. And st even still, you know, you might see those so things happening, you know, especially in the um, in, in the Arab world, right? You see, they greet each other in that way. So, you know, if you take that and if you declare that as a truth, you're going to end up, uh, you know, creating confusion. We are going to end up uh, creating a lot of hurt, right? And that is why people stay away from the truth sometimes, right? Um, like I, I, I was listening to, um, I, I don't know if some of you know, I don't want to mention the name of this person. Like She comes from an Islamic background and um, and a very zealous believer and uh, serving the Lord. And uh, she was mentioning about how there is a church uh, where she comes from. And, uh, and in that church, it's so culturally relevant for that community, right? Islamic community where people come, they sit on the floor. Okay. They come wearing their traditional, you know, that hijab. Um, they feel comfortable doing that. So it's, they just wear that, and the Bible is uh, is 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 shared. It, it's I mean it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's there. It's kept in a in a stand, like how you know that holy scripture would be kept. You know, it's kept in a stand. It's kept right there in front. People sit on the floor. Um, there are no like guitars or you know everything that could be considered as a Western culture. Right? Uh, it's not there. Uh, well, there uh, is is there singing? I'm not sure, too sure. But definitely, you know, the, the prayers and everything, uh, people are, it's more of a recitation. It's more of people, you know, uh, echoing or reciting back what is what is being spoken, what is being said. Okay, So um, very culturally relevant. Is it, uh, you know, is there truth in what they have, is the content of what is being shared is definitely the truth of God's word. Uh, is it producing life? Is it producing, you know, fruit? Definitely. Uh, people are coming, you know, uh, people are being saved and people are coming to the saving knowledge of Christ. Well, simply because that it's culturally relevant. Okay. They've not, uh, the, well, the person who was leading the church did not take, take something which was, um, they did not say, hey, you need to change everything. You know, you, you can't, you stop you know, wearing this kind of a headgear, you stop, you know, um, growing your beard long, you start, you know, shaving it. No, they said, you come as you are, you know, this is something close to your culture, it's fine. There's nothing in, in all that, what you're doing, which is contradicting the truth. The moment it contradicts, we will point out, but it's not contradicting right now. Whatever is superficial, it's, it's uh, you know, external. Let's go with it. So that produces life. Okay. So, so also, you know, when we look at uh, scripture, we need to see what is cultural and what is eternal truth. Because culture could be for that time period, it could be for that group of people, for that geographical location, it need not always be for us. Okay. Um, whereas the truth supersedes culture, transcends culture, goes beyond that. Right? It's eternal, and um, it transcends. You know, people's group and ethnicity and all that, it's its relevant for all. It's a kingdom culture, right? So it helps for us to know the difference, okay? Okay, a few more things, okay? It helps when we interpret things critically. What does, uh, you know, 
what is critical thinking or when we say you know you look at something critically what does it mean okay so it um, let me try and put this okay so it, it basically means that we we analyze available facts evidence observations arguments etc to form a conclusion to form a judgment okay so there's nothing wrong in using reason uh, god is the god who created us emotionally the god who created us physically is the one who created us to think rationally so you know we uh, we look at all these things which are there the facts and uh, everything that god has present uh, god has um, given us we, ob- we what we observe and we use our mind right we think um and then we come to a conclusion okay so let's look at some of these uh, uh things you know six practical rules that we can look at okay um you know the bible it, itself we see that it's an amazing amazing work right uh, if you look at the time period if you look at the number of uh, people who wrote it or um, you know who were used by god to put together it's amazing it it can be it's nothing short of miraculous it's nothing short of the supernatural to have one common thread from genesis to revelation and everything you know pointing to the cross and from the cross it's is amazing right um and it's so life giving right it is the word of god okay so when we inter- interpret it okay, some of these practical things that we can look at interpret in the light of the context of the passage okay so now since you've studied the course i just want to ask you, you now what does it mean interpret in light of the context anyone when we say you interpret this scripture in the light of the context um what does this mean okay jefina is here so i'll ask her <laughs> jefina what does it mean interpret in light of the context okay there is a text okay and then text is placed in a setting means it has as a you know it has a story it has a, it has a setting to it a background to it and what we call as the context okay so it's important to look at the context of that particular text okay um um i th- i think there are some examples there that we can look at okay so questions like okay where is this text from is it in the old testament is it in the new okay who's the author what time period okay so that itself should give us an understanding okay is it so old testament okay so it was before the cross um so it was in the old dispensation um so okay so this is how the holy spirit moved you know all these things come into play right this is how the holy spirit ministered uh, to people okay there was not the indwelling presence of the holy spirit common among all the believers of yahweh but he would come for a season he would uh, anoint a person for a season for a particular task and uh, he would go so that is how he moved okay so in the new testament now it's going to be different um so this is how it is so text is talking something about um the holy spirit and the ministry of the holy spirit so you understand or or a person who is uh, moved by the holy spirit right then you understand okay this is the context it is it is in this uh, in this dispensation so therefore you know uh, okay these are some things that i can conclude Okay. it's very important because when we do a character study right uh, sometimes we look at the text okay david this 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 david lived in the old dispensation he did some amazing things um he he produced some great songs uh, he, he, he uh, there was some amazing prophecies and all that and uh, in the old old dispensation right so well does it up, does everything about david apply to me or you know when i'm studying when i'm learning a lot of things but there are some critical differences as well because he was 
you know, in the time of the old dispensation, he was looking towards the cross. And here I am in the new dispensation, looking back at the cross. And there are certain things that I've, I, I enjoy today, which David did not have. Right? The indwelling presence of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit being released and so on. So, so there are some differences. So while I can apply a lot of things, while I can learn a lot of things from doing a character study of, of the psalmist of, of David, you know, there are things that are different as well, right? So I need to understand that. So you take the text and you uh, look at the context of the passage, okay? Um, okay, in line with that also, okay, in the light of progressive revelation, okay? So, okay, under which covenant was it written, right? In which dispensation? Um now their understanding according, people walked according to the understanding or in the light of what they knew. Okay. And God was unfolding the truth to them. Okay. And several examples here you can go through, you know, uh, example about polygamy, example about theocracy, and, uh, about sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and so on. Right. Um, you know, especially about, you know, multiple uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we studied about marriage in the previous class. So, you know, this is something that is relevant. You know, yeah, polygamy was permitted, uh, but it was never affirmed or encouraged, right? We see that, and uh, we see it's a progressive revelation. You know, uh, and we see in the New Testament that very clearly instructed. Okay. Um, also, you know, we read about secular government and uh, the theocracy of God, the government of God. The government of God in the Old Testament, you know, God spoke, God did things, he had, he raised up kings, he He did things on the earth through, um, through a ruler, and uh, he spoke certain things through that prophet, to that ruler, and so on. But we see, you know, uh, in the New Testament, we are, we are, we are, we are, that we are to pray for rulers, that we are to pray for government, people um, who are, you know, holding such positions, which means that God is not against that, and uh, we see that kind of a thing happening, the change happening, and God is not against that, right? And God will bring His plans and purpose even through those, um, you know, uh, structures, governmental structures. So we see that animal sacrifices again in the Old Testament. Well, they were instituted; uh, mm -hmm. it was done. Uh, God clearly, you know, very, very in, in minute detail, He described each and everything that needs to be done. But we also know that it was referring to something that the Lord Jesus would do on the cross. This was sacrifice was symbolic of what would happen on the cross. And, uh, and the Lord Jesus carried our sin and everything on the cross. And by one sacrifice, he put, you know, he, he, he removed what was actually separating man from God. So do we need any more sacrifices? No, the sacri ultimate sacrifice was already made. So things like that, you know, so, you know, if, if you're going to be having animal sacrifices saying, you know, God requires that, then it's a, it becomes a heresy because uh, it's something that you're trying to do uh, in order to please God. But God has already had a sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for himself in the person of Jesus. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, to interpret scripture in harmony with other scripture okay so you know uh, so when we when we do that you know there is no contradiction okay when we look at uh, a scripture passage and when we look at uh, certain other scripture passages in order to come to the conclusion you know so scripture interprets scripture okay and um, and is this is this aspect of the truth that the scripture is, uh, you know, uh, proclaiming, is it in harmony with the other? Well, a classic example is this, you know, that um, we see that, uh, okay, let's take this scripture of, you know, Genesis 2, and one has to leave. For this reason, a man leaves. And the word used there, you know, like I said, is very, um, a very strong word, means abandon, forsake. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So if he, if he's just going, holding on to that, then it would mean that I would disrespect 
totally cut away all relationships with my mother and father, with my parents. But when we study it in the light of other scripture, right? when we look at um, the, the commandments that were given by the Lord, when we look at it in the light of other scriptures, you see that then it brings that wholeness, right? So we need to do that. What is the what is the the whole truth, right? Uh, so this what I'm holding on to is it in harmony with other things, especially when it seems to be so contradictory, so radical, like so different. Is it in harmony? Um, so that will give us uh, the right perspective, right? Okay. From time to time, I'm just looking at the chat just to see if anybody is asking any questions. Okay. Uh, interpret the unclear in the light of the clear. Okay, so this is a rule of basic rule of thumb is that don't build a doctrine or a teaching or a set of instructions and you know uh, based on a very unclear passage. Okay, so if it's an unclear passage, you look at you know look at what is clear, what is very apparent and you know completely um, you know it, it's there in great detail. Look at the clear, right? So don't if something is not clear, don't build an entire doctrine out of it because that could create a damage, right, to the church uh, and to whom to whomever we are sharing the truth. Uh, the truth, okay? Um, like for scriptures like this, right? Um, and I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous unrighteous mam mammon. Uh, Luke sixteen nine. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. And apparently, this was used by the church of that time for the practice of indulgences. Right? You studied what indulgences is, right? Uh, basically, these are licenses to sin. Right? So you pay a certain amount of money to the priest um, in the church, and the and the priest would issue an indulgence, saying, "Okay, uh, uh, it's like a certificate saying, okay, this person uh, is permitted this particular sin." And the church had come to such a level where, you know, they had a menu, uh, you know, okay, they had a price list. This sin, so much. This is what you give as an indulgence, and then you'll be permitted to commit that sin. You know? So you see that heresy had something from scripture. They picked it up and they said, okay, we can do this. Another scripture, 1, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29, it says, okay, this baptism for the dead. You know, the whole thing of purgatory and praying for the dead, praying for the saints um, who were actually dead and gone, praying for already dead. Uh, the whole practice coming out of this verse. Whereas, um, you know, Paul was actually not condoning it. He was actually referring to a particular custom, which was done by those people and he was referring to that to actually point to a greater truth saying hey, even those people believe that there is life after death okay, okay so uh, when you study you know corinthians you'll you'll understand it in great detail okay so you interpret the unclear in the light of the clear okay i guess we'll stop here there are just a couple of things um interpret the spirit of the passage and also um interpret with dependence on the holy spirit so we'll cover that in the next class um and then we'll go forward Okay, um, so like I said, we will, um, you know, that upgraded notes, uh, I'll put it up and then you can download that. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, we'll meet again on Thursday. Okay, God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor. See you. Bye. Thank you, Pastor.